welcome everybody uh, to this uh, public launch webinar um, for the research report to support um, what we call the insulation roadmap, uh, but what's really about ensuring quality control and safety in insulation installation uh, and ultimately an industry led roadmap for healthy and comfortable buildings. Uh, this has been a piece of work that I personally, um, my name is Suzanne Tumbaru, I'm the Executive Director of the Australian Sustainable Build Environment Council, um, I'm really interested uh, in seeing delivered and, and come to light. Uh, it's one of the important pillars uh, in helping to ensure that we are able to develop, uh, deliver more sustainable, healthy, energy efficient, comfortable buildings, making sure that insulation, which is one of the most cost effective uh, measures in those buildings uh, is properly installed uh, and is uh, trusted and is done really well to a level of great quality. Um, I'll hand, hand over now to Tony Arnell. Uh, Tony is the president of the Energy Efficiency Council. He also happens to be the chair of uh, my organisation, ASBEC's Building Quality Task Group. Uh, and uh, he wears many other hats and a very treasured member of the building sector. Welcome, Tony. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Thank you for that introduction and also for working with the Energy Efficiency Council um, to engage with experts and draft this report. I, I must say that the collaboration between ASBEC and the Energy Efficiency Council has been, has been outstanding and we very much appreciate uh, your personal leadership on this very important project. Um, so look, I just want to speak uh, for about five minutes before I uh, hand back to Suzanne, uh, just to sort of put the, the things in context and to sort of set the scene, if you like. But we know that safe quality insulation installation is a, is a critical part of ensuring that all homes are healthy and comfortable. We also, we also know that insulation is a critical part of a well-functioning building envelope. Uh, a major function of a, of a building should be keeping occupants cool in summer and warm in winter. That's pretty fundamental. However, we all know that we need to dramatically improve the quality of insulation of Australian buildings. Many buildings, uh, particularly the ones constructed before the early 2000s have um, have little or even no insulation and poor air tightness and, uh, and ventilation. And this does contribute to Australia having almost double the rate of deaths caused by cold winter, uh, as cold weather as Stockholm in Sweden. So just think about that. We've heard some of these stories before, but records show that hundreds of Australians have ended in hospital from hypothermia that they've uh, contracted indoors um, and a shocking 2,600 Australians actually die each year due to cold weather. And similarly, hot weather kills hundreds of Australians each year. Look, these are really appalling statistics. But the good news is, and this is why we're all here, we know that we can fix uh, a lot of this. Research suggests that improving existing buildings uh, in where I am at the moment, Melbourne, uh, could reduce deaths from heat waves by an astonishing 90%, so nine out of 10. What's more, taking action just won't save lives. Retrofitting insulation into existing buildings and improving the construction of new buildings will dramatically cut people's energy bills and really importantly, create thousands of jobs. The IMF and the IEA, uh, who we pay a lot of attention to, they estimate that the energy efficiency upgrades to buildings um, can create up to 15 jobs per $1 million of expenditure. And that adds up to uh, a lot of employment. However, to make our buildings better, we need to ensure that insulation is installed safely and using proper quality controls. It has to be, that. Let's face it, it has to be both safe and it has to be effective. And there are, I'm pleased to say, many excellent insulation installers in Australia, especially in this audience today. We've got quite a number of people actually on the call, but there aren't enough 
systems in place to ensure that insulation is always installed in the way that it should be. So this report that we're launching today sets out the findings and recommendations of the project team to ensure that insulation is installed following appropriate quality control and safety processes. So these recommendations consider substantial input from experts in a broad range of fields, including policy makers, uh, insulation manufacturers, insulation installers, the construction industry, and experts in building design and sustainability. And one of the hallmarks of this particular piece of research that we've done uh, through the EEC and through ASPEC has been the wide consultation that has gone on. And uh, for those of you who have been involved in uh, many of the calls over the last uh, three or four months, you'll understand that. Um, it, I'd like to, and on that basis, I'd like to particularly thank um, all the participants, but particularly the members uh, of the Insulation Roadmap Task Group uh, for their support and, and the way we've been able to develop these recommendations and for also keeping uh, Rob and Julianne and the team on track. And I'd also like to thank Holly uh, from the EC for her input in the very early days. It has been my uh, privilege to chair the task group and to sit on the steering committee to, to ensure that the views of all of the experts uh, from around the country and from around the globe uh, were carefully considered by the team who actually wrote this report. However, while the many people that contributed to this report through submissions, interviews and the task group and the steering committee were essential to pulling this report together, None of them have been asked to formally endorse it yet. So it's very important today to understand that this uh, particular report is the report from, from the team. And we're going to be going through a process over the next month to uh, get to a conclusion, which I'll explain now. So as I say, while the contributions of a large number of people were critical, the report uh, would not have been possible without the people that commissioned us to write the report to write this independent report uh, and to do the research. And I would like to specifically mention uh, just a few that um, have serious skin in the game, as they say. Uh, certainly, uh, Insulation Australasia, uh, ICANS, the Insulation Council of Australia and New Zealand, uh, the Government of New South Wales, and also the Government uh, of uh, Victoria, where I am, uh, for sponsoring the project. So, so without the leadership of all of you and certainly the leadership of our largest state governments um, and the industry's um, uh, premier associations, uh, and as I say, the valuable input from a wide variety of experts and stakeholders, this publication would certainly not have been possible. And it is, as we all know, it is extremely timely. So what's next? Um, well, uh, exciting times, I think. Over the next month, uh, industry will consider the findings of the report and work together to develop what we're, what we're describing as a roadmap uh, that will uh, de-risk insulation, installation in both residential and commercial settings and in retrofits, major renovations and new builds. And this roadmap, as we're describing it, include clear actions for industry and recommendations for actions from government and other parties. So I'm delighted to be able to uh, uh, reveal uh, this report to you today and to share um, you know, what is um, an exciting upcoming um, time in relation to how these recommendations hopefully get adopted um, and then get implemented and really change the course of uh, the way we're currently dealing with um, uh, thermal comfort in buildings in Australia. We know it is a, an extremely important step towards a healthier uh, and more comfortable built environment in Australia. So ladies and gentlemen, that's enough from me. As I said, I've been very pleased to uh, chair the task group and I'd like now to uh, pass back to Suzanne, who is going to um, facilitate the remainder of today's presentation. Thank you, Suzanne.
Tony, thank you. And thank you for painting such a, uh, a comprehensive picture of, of why we're here, why this is important and why the time is right too. Um, I, I'd like to hand um, over to Rob Murray-Leach, the Head of Policy at the Energy Efficiency Council. Rob is the lead researcher on this uh, on the Insulation Roadmap Project and has done some extraordinary work uh, in uh, delivering um, this uh, this research report. Um, Rob, congratulations on pulling this together and all the very intensive engagement and research that you've undertaken. Um, just a quick note for some, for those who are interested uh, in asking questions about uh, what Rob is about to present, um, please use the Q&A function to submit questions you may have during Rob's presentation. And uh, we'll, we'll address those questions in the Q&A session during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. But Rob, over to you. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about the report. Thanks so much, Suzanne. And um, Julianne, if we could get the slides up, that would be great. Just so you know, behind me, uh, this is actually a filter that I've got behind me. It's not actually my very messy home. Uh, my home is actually immaculate, but I, I do this to make everyone feel more comfortable. So, um, I'm going to, without further ado, crack on with the presentation about where we're going. If we could um, move to the next slide, Julianne. So um, one of the things I have to be honest, that was a real struggle with this report was finding ways to represent insulation because there's such a broad range of materials and products involved in insulation. Uh, and hence why we have such a simple logo on the front of our report, um, a warm day with insulation and it's nice and cool inside. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? Um, yes, there's economic benefits and yes, there's environmental benefits and they're very important, but the really thing I wanna come, come back to at the center is uh, insulation is central to a comfortable, healthy home. Uh, we know that around 2,600 people die each year in Australia from cold weather, uh, hundreds of people die each year from hot weather, and that's projected to rise as temperatures rise. Uh, we also know that our homes are critical in this. So uh, making our homes better, uh, would, for example, in Victoria, reduce the number of deaths in a heat wave by 90%. So it's a very serious health and safety issue. Next slide. So making sure that our insulation is, is, is right is important for our health, for our well-being. Uh, we know it reduces emissions quite, quite substantially. From our research, it was uh, the, the research that was being done, I think, by ASBEC and Climate Works. It's about 6.1 uh, megatons. Um, just from insulating correctly. And of course it saves money, but more importantly with that dollar logo, it creates a huge number of jobs with the International Energy Agency and the International Monetary Fund uh, working together to conclude it was the best bang for buck in stimulus, creating 15 jobs per million dollars of investment. Uh, next slide, please. So those are the benefits of insulation, but we know that we can't achieve that without insulation being installed correctly. So if we move on to why, uh, next slide. So in terms of quality, if you don't install insulation correctly, if there are gaps, that's a big issue. You have thermal bridging is an issue both for heat transfer, but also condensation. Uh, you have fire risks. If for example, you um, don't put uh, enough space around luminaires. Um, and then there's condensation and ventilation issues. The reason that's a different color is some of those are due to the installation, but we are aware of course, that a lot of issues around condensation and ventilation are other systems that interact with the insulation sure. itself. Next slide. There's also issues in the installation of insulation in terms of its safety. So we need to make sure that uh, we deal with working at heights, working in restricted spaces, uh, overheating and electrical safety. Now, of course, there have been definitely high profile incidents, I'm sure you're all aware of in that space. Um, but relatively speaking, insulation is an extremely safe building product compared to many other aspects of the construction industry. You don't need power tools to cut it. It's very lightweight. Uh, it's a very inert material. Most of the materials are highly inert. So it's actually a very safe area, but it is still a high profile issue and one that we need to deal with. Uh, so those are issues that need to be dealt with in themselves as we roll out and we need to dramatically roll out really insulation to all the older buildings in Australia that have very poor insulation, uh, as well as making sure all new buildings are done correctly. Um, yes, we need to do those things correctly, but it's really important. One of the reasons we need to do those things correctly, and if we could go to the next slide, um, is that ultimately we need these homes to be insulated and we will not have the public permission and the community acceptance unless we deal with those things. The good news is that we can deliver healthy, 
comfortable homes by installing insulation safely and uh, with quality controls very easily. There's actually a lot of good case studies about how we can do that. If we can move to the next slide. So how do we do this? So this report, there was an extensive literature review and I really would like to um, thank my colleague, Julianne Tice, who really led the work in the literature review, uh, reading uh, hundreds of papers, literally hundreds of papers on issues around this. Um, second thing was global case studies. So we decided rather than going blanket, you can do, uh, you know, contact 50 different countries and look at their things very shallowly. It doesn't actually give you the resolution, the detail to understand how people do things. So we looked at the UK, we looked at Ireland, we looked at the US, uh, we looked at Germany and we looked at New Zealand, how they ensure that insulation was installed safely and with quality control. Then once we, as we were pulling this material together, we were also extensively consulting with experts in the country. And I really do want to reiterate what Tony said, this report would not be possible without the huge amount of time uh, and effort that people put into supporting it. Um, there are many people I would like to, to single out, but it would take the entire presentation. So uh, you know who you are and I, this report really would not be possible without your input. In addition to doing lots of interviews and engagement with experts, we also had a task group which um, was effectively a standing body to make sure that the experts' voices were heard and, and ideas were shared amongst that group. So where there were disagreements, they sort of played out in that space and we could listen to that. And then we had a steering committee that oversaw it and that was uh, Insulation Australasia, ICANN's, the uh, Victorian government and the New South Wales government. They don't endorse this report. Their job was to make sure that we were staying on track and doing a good job. So it's a quality report, but not necessarily one that they endorsed, but they made sure that we did, we worked hard, uh, it's, it's fair to say. So I'm gonna come on to the conclusions in the report. So if we could move to the next slide. We identified a range of actions that need to be done. So the first thing is that these actions were very common across the countries that we looked at. And actually Australia is already doing quite a lot in most of these spaces, but there are significant gaps compared to what we saw overseas. So there's training and accreditation. Uh, there's what are we doing to make sure that retrofits are done correctly. Uh, there's issues that we need to deal with in new construction and renovations. Uh, and then there's some actions around beyond insulation. So I'll talk about the recommendations that, as Tony said, they are, you know, in effect, uh, my, my conclusions of recommendations based on everything we researched and heard. Um, uh, and I, I will take the pain on my shoulders, but it would not have been possible um, without uh, Julianne and Suzanne and everyone involved in this, but absolutely every error in here is my fault. Um, these are just mine. And the idea is that we will work to work with people to identify clear actions in a roadmap in a moment. So next slide. Training and accreditation. What we identified is there is basic training and accreditation. When I say basic, as in for somebody who's never done insulation before and they want to make sure that they're doing it, it exists. It's actually quite good. Um, however, there's very few people who've done it. Right? So we, we know, for example, um, with one particular quality system, only about 200 people have been through it uh, and a total of around, uh, I think, 20 people have become fully accredited in the entire country over the last five years. So very low numbers, good system. Uh, we need to do a review. Is it fit for purpose? I think the evidence suggests it's pretty good. Um, how can we make sure that we get it right before we start doing more fundamental things? So a little bit of tweaking around that. Um, but it does need a, a deep independent review with the insulation industry, governments and other people being involved. The second thing which doesn't exist at the moment is specialist modules. So once you've done that basic training, you need to have additional training modules that are, that are recognized um, around, for example, pumped wall insulation. Things that are quite complicated and require additional skills. The third thing we realize is there's some people who've been doing insulation for a very long time. Uh, and there's also a need for a development pathway. So what we've identified is the need for certified insulation leaders. Now, a lot of these already act uh, in effect in the industry, but they're not recognized. These are the sort of people, for example, that would come to a home, work out what insulation is required to be installed, uh, deal with safety issues uh, and check those over. And then they send out the team with the correct products to go and install it. And then they review their work to make sure it's been done correctly. So they specify the work and they review it in a retrofit uh, and they have similar roles in new builds. So there are some people doing that already, but it's a real gap. There's a lot of places where it's not happening. Uh, and we really need to get that recognition of those existing skill sets there. So what we're sort of suggesting there is it's, it's really grandfathering and existing skills rather than forcing people who know what they're doing to do courses. It's basically uh, some sort of potentially an online exam that people could do to demonstrate their knowledge. And then they can become certified in that space. 
they'd have to have quite a lot of knowledge around national construction code and other areas. Um, they would need to know about insulation materials, safety issues. So it's a broad range of knowledge, but we know that there are people out there operating with that skill set already. The fourth area of uh, training is CPD for other trades. So, um, for example, electricians or plumbers who are often come to a site interfere with the insulation because they have to, to do their job, but then don't put it back properly. Uh, and that's a genuine issue that we have heard about many, many times. And we've seen examples of it. So making sure that they having additional training about how to do it quickly and simply and how important it is, is critical. Uh, the final thing is additional training for building surveyors. Uh, as with all the other areas, there are already a lot of surveyors who know what they're doing, but we did identify there's a potential shortfall in building surveyors being able to identify once a building's been complete, uh, has the insulation been done correctly? Uh, in the report, that, that final recommendation is actually put in the new construction sector, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that later. Next slide. So people are trained and accredited. Is that enough? Uh, no. So the first thing we realize is we need to have some national guidelines for the installation processes for retrofits in particular, but also new builds, but particularly for retrofits. The good news is there is already an Australian standard for installation, AS3999, um, but it's quite long, it's quite complicated, and it's very hard, for example, for either a company or a government to use it like a checklist and just check if everything's been done correctly. So turning that comprehensive document into quite simple documents that are easy for companies and governments and people overseeing insulation to use uh, is really critical. And we saw lots of other countries had done effectively exactly that. Uh, the second thing is a list of verified products. So if you are installing insulation uh, in a new build, you do have to meet the current standard for insulation, um, or you have to use insulation that meets that standard. But um, there isn't really a one-stop shop where you can go to just check if products meet that standard. And we think that's going to be very helpful, particularly for government programs. So that's something that can be done relatively simply uh, by industry in conjunction with government because that testing already happens. It's just confirming that that testing has been done at a correct sort of lab and then publishing that on one list. Of course, noting that that list would not be commenting on which product is better or worse. It's just has it passed the standard. The final recommendation, there's quite a few here, is where governments, so we're not recommending that governments do do insulation programs, although of course I strongly do believe that, but that's not in here. Um, what it's saying is when governments do public programs, they should commit to ensuring quality control processes. So that's making sure you're using accredited people, making sure you're using accredited products, and making sure you're using those national guidelines. So those national guidelines can be voluntary, but under a government program, we recommend that they're mandatory. Government should also look at pre-approving companies. Um, so in other words, when you run a program, you should put out a tender to, to have people apply and you should be testing their systems. Very basic, that's what happens in, in all the other countries we saw that were doing insulation rollouts. And finally, you need to audit once uh, a number of insulations once they've been done. So um, for example, in New Zealand, I think it's around 5% of sites that are upgraded under government programs, whether that's public housing or retrofits to low-income households. It's audited. Somebody goes and checks the site to make sure it's been done correctly. Next slide. The new build area was one that I have to say, when we started this report, I thought it was going to be the least interesting with not much recommendations. And I'd love to say that the experts that we spoke to uh, quickly disabused me of this notion. There is a lot to do in this space. So there's a lot more quality control and safety processes in place in construction sites and safety issues are uh, still existing, but much lower in a construction site because electricity is not connected, the wiring is all new, um, uh, often spaces aren't fully enclosed. So lots of issues are done quite, and, and often insulation is installed from underneath in ceilings, for example. So it is a generally uh, much more safety control processes in place than retrofits, but they are still significant. So the first thing we identified is the importance of improving compliance. Um, that's a Shergold Weir uh, recommendation, um, the Building Confidence Report, which is really uh, you know, a groundbreaking report in the building space and is far beyond insulation, but we've identified that there are specific issues for insulation in, in quality control. So first, uh, we just encourage governments to continue their strong work on improving compliance in new build and renovation work under the National Construction Code and associated uh, regulations, uh, such as basics. The second thing is that currently we realize there's actually a really useful quality control process 
theoretically already in place. So a lot of companies issue builders with a certificate of insulation once a building has been insulated. Um, that doesn't always happen. And it varies between companies and it varies between jurisdictions. But that's actually a really important point. If you have a certified insulation leader, so somebody who's been demonstrated to have the knowledge to determine whether insulation has been installed correctly and to a high level of quality, somebody needs to have that level of knowledge to be able to sign it off. So that certificate of insulation should be formalized in all jurisdictions and should be required to be signed off by a certified insulation professional. So in other words, you get some installers into your house, um, they do the install in the new in the new build and then they can sign off the certificate. Yes, it's been in installed in accordance with it. That certificate can go to the surveyor, it can go to the homeowner, it can go to various people, but it has to be signed off by somebody who actually is in a position to determine whether it's actually been installed correctly. Third, uh, so that's sort of internal quality control, the certificate of insulation. The third thing is external. So it's the building surveyors need to be provided with photos of the insulation installation, because a lot of the time it's covered up with plasterboard after it's installed and in, uh, surveyors are not in a position to determine if it's been done correctly. Uh, it's very, very hard for them to do that. And it's very cheap to take digital photos on your phone after it's been installed, job done, photos, date and time stamped automatically, and they go into a document. And good providers are already doing that. That's the great thing is that good install, ins, insulation installers are already following that process. So it's not extra steps for people who are doing it right. It's not red tape. The second thing we recommend there in terms of building surveyors is cost benefit study to determine whether thermal imaging and on-site or remote visits by a building surveyor are required um, during the install process or after the install process. The reason we're saying that needs a cost benefit study, we heard some very different perspectives in that. And based on the information we provided, we're unable to determine if the cost and benefits stack up, but it's very clear that it's worth considering and that governments uh, should look at that with industry to determine whether that is something worth pursuing. But as we said, it is a very, very clear case that building surveys should at the very least be provided with photos of, uh, of insulation installations. Finally, um, we need to drive the uptake of basic installer training. So what we found is that in the new build space, a big chunk of installers are people who specialize in insulation installation. They are well-trained. They know what they're doing. However, even amongst there, sometimes subcontractors are used who don't know what they're doing. Uh, and a lot of the time as well, people who do not specialize in insulation are doing the installation. And it's very hard to know how many of those have got the appropriate skills. So requiring a minimum qualification around uh, insulation, uh, safety and quality control for installation is a desirable thing. We think as a minimum that industry should, um, as in building companies, uh, hopefully associations, um, insulation insulation associations should voluntarily say we will require the use of training uh, and if that doesn't happen sufficiently then government should then look at whether it should become mandatory final slide so finally one thing that we realized on the first day of this report um, and it's absolutely essential is that high quality insulation uh, and a good thermal envelope requires not just insulation being installed correctly. It requires good design work um, combined with good installation work of the insulation, but also fenestration, uh, thermal bridging elements. I mean, even things like the building frame itself, is it metal? Okay, if it's metal, how are you making sure it's not touching internal and external walls? Um, it requires fenestration, so what's going on with the glazing, uh, ventilation issues, very significant, uh, moisture control issues. All of those need to be dealt with as a whole. So we were given a very specific task to look at insulation installation, and we've looked at it from the perspective of how does that fit into the broader story. But we also think by biting off that manageable chunk, we could actually come up with some very clear specific recommendations and we've done that. But the next step is to actually do an integrated project, we think, uh, which brings a lot of the key players, many of whom are probably on this phone call. Well, I know a lot of a lot of the key players are definitely on this phone call. Um, I suspect most of them are on this phone call. Um, we really need to make sure that um, that uh, we look at how do we do this as an integrated package. Uh, new build, uh, we need to improve it, absolutely, uh, but especially retrofit. Like there are such a small number of, I know this from doing my own house, there are such a small number of companies in this country that understand how to do an integrated retrofit or are offering that service at the sort of reasonable price point. Um, that is telling me that I'm going over. So... 
I'll close up there. So it's a really key issue. We think a major study needs to be done in that space, and we will be looking to engage with people and governments around making sure that that happens. So final slide. And my apologies for the bad pun. Next steps. Um, the reason I've got this up there is I've got this theory that the reason we wear, we invented Ugg boots in Australia is because we have to insulate our feet because we don't insulate our homes. What's happening next? So this is a set of independent advice from us from doing research. Um, the next step is over the next about sort of uh, four to six weeks, we'll be working with a variety of people in the industry to see if we can come up with a set of actions that we agree with that everybody agrees with, that we as industry can say, yes, we support these and we will do our part where it's, you know, there's an action against our name, we'll do it. So, um, but we're also going to be making recommendations to people who don't sign the report. So for example, people, uh, governments. So um, we'll be working with that over the next four to six weeks. And we're really looking for your participation in that. Without further ado, I'll hand back to Suzanne for Q&A. Thanks, Rob, uh, and thanks for the, the thorough overview there. Um, I, I guess it, um, it it is a challenge to make sure that uh, you explore as deeply as possible within the parameters of the scope you've been provided, noting that, uh, and I'm looking at the, the questions that have been posed here, uh, just how much more this touches on. Mm. Um, before we jump into kind of the, the broader realm of issues that um, that this does touch on, I might just uh, look at Owen Batchelor's question. Yep. Uh, Owen says that he can see immediately the benefit in quality control by mandating an ex <coughs> inspection by a building certifier prior to sheeting. <laughs> This would also capture defects in framing and poorly installed services. <coughs> was this considered? Oh yes, that was that was a that's why Suzanne sort of smiling. It's a great question, Owen. Um, yes, we considered it. It was one of the things that came out as a big shock to me early on when we spoke to other countries and we realised that they did inspections before um, plasterboard goes up, uh, which obviously allows them to inspect electrical, uh, plumbing work, a uh, whole range of things. And 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 in fact, in the US, they were they were complaining because. Uh, even though insulation was inspected during that stage, uh, it could have been inspected more. That's one of the recommendations. So the recommendation is that there is a cost benefit study on doing that. Um, the reason for it being a cost benefit study, and there's probably two reasons. So one, there are significant cost implications. Those need to be looked into as well as the benefits. Um, the second thing is that one of the things we did find is that there's such a rapid change in the products and insulation and building materials sometimes uh, there isn't such a sort of thing as a stage where you could inspect it like it goes up like increasingly what we're seeing in europe for example is structural integrated panels um so that would not make a huge difference for that but it's a really important issue and i think it's actually much broader than insulation um and uh, my understanding is that it actually used to be the standard in australia that, is, that a, a building was inspected prior to plasterboard going up for the obvious reasons that you uh, you raised so very good point yes it's considered uh, and there's a strong recommendation in there which is a recommendation um i'll just double check that uh, recommendation 13 Thanks, Rob. Uh, I might roll a few of the questions we've had relating to air tightness and passive house and condensation and ventilation in, into one, if, if I can do so. Yeah. Terence Hill, Samantha Anderson and uh, Jeff Robinson were, were quite interested in this space yeah. uh, with a question about uh, the role for passive house in the future standards, but also how condensation and ventilation were factored into this work and the next steps um, going forward, noting that, Rob, you have it, you've, yeah. you've in part addressed that. Uh, uh, and uh, and how air tightness um, was factored as well into the work that you did. Great. Um, I'll start with the simplest and most complex, which was how was air tightness uh, factored in? Um, yeah, it, it was a big issue and one that we really, because it's it, honestly, it's such a central issue to a comfortable building. You can't talk about comfortable buildings without talking about uh, levels of air tightness and ventilation. Um, we decided that since the scope was installation of insulation, so people getting up in a roof in a retro, for example, and sticking it in, uh, or in a new building, we would uh, stick to our knitting, but stick to our knitting whilst being mindful of that much broader issue of air tightness and how that interplayed into it. So we did think about it and we thought about it in the process and we engaged with people with that question of how much should we change these recommendations based on that. But the core bit there is our recommendation for a, a bigger project because uh, there was a budget and there was a timeline for this project. 
to look properly at air tightness, you'd also need to, if you really want to do this properly, you have to look at air tightness, insulation, design, construction, fenestration, um, uh, uh, mechanical ventilation and cooling, all at the same time, um, uh, ventilation, cooling and heating, all at the same time. That's a big project. Um, and it, we think it needs to be done as a big project. You can't, you can't take that off one bite at a time because it will fail. So we looked as much as we could whilst focusing on that. Uh, second part of that, um, uh, uh, Jeff Robinson, did we look at the stringency of insulation requirements? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. Um, to be honest, our, our view there is it was a much less issue than compliance. Um, so there's work going on with stringency, um, and we thought we would look at that. Um, in, in all honesty, if, if all new buildings and all existing buildings were built to the six star standard, that would be holy hell, such a jump up in quality for insulation in Australia. So we were focused more on the install, which is not really specified in a huge amount of detail in the NCC. Um, there was a, another question, Suzanne, I think you, you rolled in a few together, didn't you? There's the Samantha uh, one. Yep. Passive house. Anyway, we've, we've, we've answered that one. The passive mm. house. Thank you. Mm. Um, first thing is I'm very annoyed that I bought a, I bought a house, um, an old one, which I'm retrofitting, although I am learning a lot through that process about what a nightmare it is. If I had my time again, I would buy a, I'll buy a plot of land or knock something down and build a passive <laughs> house. Uh, I want a passive house. Um, will it solve? If you, uh, let me put it this way. If you have a passive house and it's built to passive house standards and it's following that process, great. It's going to be absolutely nailing it. Insulation is going to be great. Air tightness is going to be great. The level of quality control and checking that I see in the passive industry in Australia is extraordinary and substantially above industry practice. However, we have to recognize that it is still fairly niche in Australia. And since we're not going to be able to mandate passive house, we have to look at how we make other, make sure that, uh, you know, the general bog standard builders and the you know, general bulk building and retrofit work is, is starting to get on the foothills to the quality approach taken by Passive House. So I hope that answers uh, that question. Yes, Passive House is fantastic. Um, I wish mine was. It is not. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, look, there are quite a few questions coming in and we're, we are fast running out of time. One of the ones that interests me the most is who's doing the best government installation programs worldwide? And, uh, uh, and did you look at incentives to encourage installation? What's working well? Mm, mm, mm. Um, the, the interesting thing is like everyone, almost everyone's a long way ahead of us. I'm sorry to say, you know, uh, if we can be quite honest, um, everyone's better. We, we, we lost, a t we were less a decade of good policy, uh, on this space. And it has been a bit of a case of people going, uh, okay. A bit of industry and government handballing it between each other. Who's going to do what, which is why the, the really progressive governments that supported this program in the insulation industry said, let's do this together. We need to work out and work out a plan between ourselves. Um, who's doing it really well? I have to say, I mean, Germany, uh, Ireland, UK doing really great work, have been doing it for a long time. US is actually pretty good, been doing that for a while. New Zealand, uh, over the ditch, the great lesson there is that they were woeful a decade ago. I mean, really bad, really problematic. And over the last 10 years, they've become, uh, I think, genuinely a world leader, uh, at least in, in practical stuff. And that's really important as well, because it's a small country with a small population so they don't have a lot of money to throw out building the world's best program they just go what's practical and how can we get it out the door so new zealand's doing a really good job there um, and some governments in australia are actually doing um, some pretty good stuff in terms of insulation uh, rebates in all honesty the first step for me is governments doing it right in public buildings um, and low-income households because then they can have so much more control and in effect if you think of it they're a very sophisticated buyer so you don't have to have all these uh, you know complicated mandates in place and blah 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 in effect government public building upgrades can act as the incubator to a quality industry because they go okay we we only want people with these skills and we want it done properly and we will audit it that will never happen in the private sector and that was a global lesson from our engagement um with all the countries around the world that um uh, uh julianne and i spent huge amounts of time on is basically government upgrades of their own buildings or low or vulnerable households was the core of developing a quality industry because what we heard in the uk for example they have no quality controls for the private retrofit industry um what they do though is that they have such a big program for public housing and vulnerable housing that if you want to be an insulation game in the uk you get qualified and you get good at what you do because otherwise you can't access those programs mm. 
Yeah, makes absolute sense. Uh, we still have a lot of questions um, oh. to address and uh, and probably, Rob, if we can squeeze in maybe two more. Um, one of the questions relates to the regulation that might be currently in place to check the which materials are acceptable as insulation. Yep. I think that, that your report kind of has addressed that specifically. Yes, um, th th there is. It's already required under the National Construction Code. Under the National Construction Code, you have to do, uh, you have to install insulation that complies with AS, <clears throat> I'll, I'll find the name of it in a second. <laughs> um, it's, it's for, I, I don't want to screw, stuff it up because I know we have so many people who really know their stuff online. AS 4859.1 um, sets very clear standards for the quality of insulation and, and sets requirements that it has to be tested. And it's mandated if you're in the MCC now. However, it does seem a much grayer area in the retrofit world. Um, and it does seem, we, we have heard stories that a small amount of stuff out there is not being tested and has been brought in from overseas. So anything manufactured in Australia will meet that standard, right? But um, stuff that has been brought in from overseas has not, but we have heard it's, it's a problem, but it's a pretty small problem, um, but nonetheless one worth addressing. So that's addressed in recommendation six. Lovely. Um, given that we have two minutes before we need to close off, uh, I'm wondering whether potentially some of these um, these very good questions might be captured mm. uh, for a response directly to the uh, to the participants. Uh, and instead, I might be impeded enough to ask my own question, which I think is probably important for us to really all be aware of: is what's next. So over the next four weeks, we'll, in fact, straight off this meeting, we're starting to have some conversations with people to start to put together a uh, recommendations built from this. We've sort of drafted a very ugly roadmap that we hope that people um, will uh, make beautiful. So my approach to consultation is always uh, put forward something very ugly and people will make it beautiful very quickly. Um, don't start with a blank sheet of paper. It's a mess. So we, we're putting something together. We'll hopefully have that in place in a month because what we understand from the consultation so far is actually a huge amount of alignment out there about what people from all the different sectors want. It's actually really great. And one of the things I have to say that's been uh, really great to see is the, the construction sector itself, the building industry. Um, they're now aware that it's actually a very small number of non-compliant people in new buildings that are the problem and that's undercutting them and lowering the quality and damaging the, the, the reputation of the sector. So now that we've got pretty good evidence, it's a very, it, it's a very small proportion that are doing really terrible work. Um, there seems to be a strong alignment that we need to drill with that. So it's really great to see that very, very broad uh, support. Wonderful. Uh, Rob, thank you for the presentation and thank you for taking the grilling um, and good luck with the with the next steps. I look forward to partnering you, with you on those too. Um, I might wrap up just really quickly um, by firstly, again, thanking the, the author of this work, Rob Murray Leach, and also the steering committee members um, who have helped to support and deliver this, Insulation Australasia, Insulation Council of Australia and New Zealand, the Government of New South Wales, the Government of Victoria, also the members of the Insulation Roadmap map task group, including the insulation industry and governments, and all those who participated in the consultation process, experts from Australia and overseas who gave invaluable input, and those who contributed submissions to the consultation paper. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for your time.